Praise the Lord. Stand with me, would you? Grab your Bibles and hold your Bibles high up to the sky, if you don't mind. And if you don't have a Bible, would you hold your hand up, up to the sky? You know, we're living in a day and age where, where in America we are so patriotic that we can say the Pledge of Allegiance. Amen? The moment you go to that basketball game, and I'm looking forward to going to the tournaments this year, but the moment you go to a basketball game, it's huge in Montana. Amen. The moment you go to a basketball tournament, everybody's riled up, everybody's excited, everybody's ready for the game to begin. Amen. And so they get ready to say the Pledge of Allegiance. And you don't have to ask those people. They automatically get up. <clears throat> so I believe that the church more than ever needs to stand when it comes to reading God's word. Say this with me. See, I can do. <clears throat> Come on. I can do. No, no. Say it with me. Ready? I can do. <clears throat> did, you hear the, did you hear the aggressiveness? I can do. I can do. What my Bible says I can do. I can be. What my Bible says I can be. I can have what my Bible says I can have. I receive it by faith from my life, my health, my wealth, my family, and my future. In Jesus' name, amen. Now listen, now say this, three, say this with me, ready? Say, say, I can do all things through Christ. I can do all things through Christ. I can do all things through Christ. Now turn around and shake someone's hand and say, don't give up, but grow up, would you? Turn around and shake somebody's hand and say, don't give up, but grow up. Come on, shake at least two or three hands. Tell them, would you? <clears throat> would you? You may be seated in the house this morning. It truly is an honor and a privilege for us to be here this morning and uh, to be back, back in, in new life in Billings. But it's also, I tell you, uh, from the moment I got asked, I got this telephone. All right, well, we got this, we got the Zoom call, and it was from Hannah and Jackson. And Mima said, oh, they, 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 they want to talk to you. Me? Yeah, they want to talk to you. Oh, about what? Uh, and I'm going, uh-oh. <laughs> what happened? <laughs> you know, first thing a pastor always thinks that, okay, get your heart ready, open it up. Counseling mind, ready to go, you know. And they said, would, we would be honored, delighted if you would, if you would join us together in marriage. And I just stand there and I said, what? <laughs> <laughs> My heart, Hannah, is still overjoyed with that. And it's going to be an honor this week to join you and Jackson to see a powerful ministry, you have no idea where her, where Jackson, well, it's actually Lashan Jackson Sr. Jackson, uh, Lashan Jackson uh, Jr. is the way I look at it, because I'm a, I'm a Wayne Boyd Jr., my dad's A. Wayne Boyd Sr., and uh, so he goes by his middle name, Jackson, his father, Lashan, they're both first names, Lashan, and uh, what a powerful ministry that her father-in-law has, and that, and that Rushing Wind, Good Heart Ministries. We've had great, powerful, I can't even begin to tell you the ministries that we do in this day and age in which we live. Amen. Amen. But uh, I, I want to I speak to your hearts this morning. I want to I, I speak to your hearts about, about what's happening in our day and age. Amen. And I want to share, share this from, from a personal experience that I have. And my wife has a good clock on her, and she's going to let me know, right, when, I, when, when I'm cooked. Ready? <laughs> Praise the Lord. When it, comes to, when it comes to this day and age in which we live, we are truly living in the end times. Everybody say the end times. Amen. Now, truthfully, raise your hand if you actually know what the end times is about. If you don't, if you don't know, don't raise your hand. Okay. So, seeing there are a few hands, the Bible refers to it as the last days, or we call it eschatology. It's the ending of the age. What age? It's the ending of, a, of the time, a, a time that God, God speaks about it in Ephesians chapter 10, really quick, Ephesians chapter 10, and, and he says it, he says it this way, he says, he says, I have planned for the maturity, for the maturity of the times and the climax of the ages to unify 
all things and head them up and consummate them in Christ. Things in heaven and things on earth. Meaning, God is saying, he's saying simply this, to God, in eternity past, there is no time. To God, in eternity present, there is no time. To God, he's creator of time. Time was created by God for one purpose, for humanity. Tap your heart, say for me. On this world, everybody that, that's, that's living on this world, we live, we live according to time. Say this with me. As a matter of fact, tap your heart, say my time is my most precious resource. It is. It is. For you would not have your marriage if you didn't have time. You would not have kids, job, family. You wouldn't, have, you wouldn't even be here if there wasn't time. So your time really is your most precious resource. So I want you to keep that in mind because we are living in the end, in the end, end times. Pastor John Kilpatrick, one of my great mentors, moves into prophetic uh, all the time. But he explains it like this, and I like the way he, he explained it. He says, when you look at Scripture, in that Scripture I just read to you in Ephesians chapter 110, it talks about the dispensation of time. And I'm about ready to get into my message here, but give me just two, two more minutes to kind of set the stage. So, he, so when the Bible talks about, when God talks about time, there's just one thing you need to know. One thing you need to know. What time period are we in now? Most people in church that was raised in church that know God, read the, read the Bible most of their lives, have no idea of what season and, and what time period we are in right now. So let me explain that to you in one minute. The Bible refers to it as the dispensation of time. Everybody say the dispensation of time. Okay? The Greek word, I don't even want to try to say it, but it starts with a no, <laughs> signifies primarily a stewardship. Everybody say stewardship. And God is the steward over all time. So in the beginning... <clears throat> The only thing that is mentioned in Scripture is when God reserved a block of time. After he put man on the earth, after he put man on the earth, after he put Adam and Eve on the earth, all righty, that's all you got to remember, that he reserved seven blocks of time, known as the dispensation of time. How many blocks? Seven blocks of time. From Genesis to Revelations, you need to see it as that because if you don't, if you don't have uh, four or five years to, to, do, uh, to go study Greek, Old, Aramaic, Hebrew, then this is it. All righty? So the dispensations of time, seven of them, seven blocks of time. Block number one, time of innocence during the time of Adam and Eve. Block number two, time of conscience. Block number three, time of human government. Block number four, time of promise. Block number five, time of law. Block number six, and this is where we're at right now. Block number six is time of grace. Everybody say time of grace. Time of grace, which we are in now. The seventh block is time of divine government and millennium reign of Christ, okay? But the seven block, the, the sixth block of time, which is grace, I, 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 I want to say it like this. Say the block is this one. And as time goes, the block gets, time gets smaller, shorter, okay? You ready? We are. <laughs> that much left. We are at the end of the church age. Say that with me. We're at the end of the church age. We are at the end when God is about ready to shift into the last block of time. Okay? This morning, my message is very simple, and it's, in, and it's entitled, You Better Get Ready to Stake Yourself to the Cross. Because the time of grace is about to close shut. And... Before it does, you probably need to know as the church, as the body of Christ, if you've never had a prayer life, <clears throat> if you've never had a solid prayer life, you're about ready to have one. And if you've had a prayer life and you've took the time, 
All that preaching, teaching, conferences, seminars that you went to <clears throat> from the day that you gave your heart for being saved for 50, 60 years, if you did, then, then you're about to raise the bar almost 10 times overnight because of what's about to happen. What are you saying? Well, let me say it this way. We are about to step into one of the last most powerful supernatural plans of God. The stage has already been set. I'm not going to go into that, but I'm, I'm going to tell you this. All, all the actors and people that are, that are placed in that, God's about ready to touch and end the seventh block of time, and then the stage is going to start moving the drama. David Wilkerson said it this way. David Wilkerson, to me, in my own opinion as pastor, to me, in my own opinion, David Wilkerson was the most prophetic man of God that lived on the face of theirs. And this is what he said. He said, believers must be. Believers. Now, that's the church. Tap your heart and say, that's me. That's the church. Believers must be discerners. Discerners of the times, the seasons, and the spirits Amen. that's characterizing this end time drama. And some of us in church have no idea what spirits are going on. And all you have to do is turn on your TV and watch the, the demonic activity that's been raised. And to me, as a man of God, I just use it as a prophetic act. The day that Donald Trump got into office, God has used that man to peel back. Layer after layer after layer. And it's still being uncovered to this day, and he's not even in office. The layer of sin, of evil, in this great country of ours. God is exposing it to the point to where it is shaking the very spiritual core of America, as Pastor and I talked last night about. We sat and we talked, we said, can you believe this? I said, I know, Pastor. I said, can you believe that? He said, I know. He said, it's unheard of of what we're dealing with in our day and time. <clears throat> I want to I, I speak to you this morning from, I'm going to put my Bible right here for now. But I'm going to put, uh, I want to I speak to you this morning real quick here. Numbers chapter 21 and verse 4. Numbers chapter 21 and verse 4. I'm reading from the Amplified, from the classic Amplified. I have to say that now because there's two, there's two Amplifieds. I love them both. And uh, Numbers 21, 4 says, And they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the people became impatient, depressed, and much discouraged because of the trials of the way. And if I was to put this in a prophetic picture right now, it would be very simple. Christian people these days are wanting to be entertained. The spiritual life of an average Christian, number one, does not include a solid prayer life. Oh, oh, only when they come to church. Oh, oh, oh. I heard some, someone say, ouch, already. I'm, I'm sorry. No, I'm not. The average Christian makes sure that they clock their time in so they can say, I've been to church. The average Christian today makes it a point to give of their tithe and offering and say, I've done my part. The average general Christian today comes and says, we need to go to church. Why? Because we just need to go to church. Why? Because it's church. And we're supposed to go to church, right? We're, 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 we're American? Land of the free, home of the brave? Come on, amen? Quick story. I love Christmas. Christmas is a, is a real, real blessed time for me. But you remember that old Christmas classic, It's a Wonderful Life? Anybody here ever see it? George Bailey? <laughs> now, don't go looking at your Bible. It's not there, all righty? George Bailey's story is not in the Bible, all righty? But it's on TV. It's a Christmas classic, and I love it. 
Very simple. George Bailey, those angels are talking in the beginning, you know. Boy, boy, the effects they had in those days, you know, in cinema. <laughs> blink a little light, blink a little light, blink a little light. Angels, you know, the main angel. Hi, go get Clarence. Why? Because it's his time. To do what? There's a, there's, a, there's a man who's about to ready to lose his life. And we need to send Clarence down there so he can earn his wings. I mean, really, sometimes, if you think about it, Christians come to church so they can earn their... Come on, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean if, if, if you really think about it, if, if you really look deep down inside of your Christian heart, it's not about the wings. <laughs> you can be flying around in heaven anyway without them, so. <laughs> George Bailey landed into a place of discouragement. Everybody say discouragement. Discouragement is coming in greater ways than you can possibly imagine. There. You need to get ready for that. Discouragement is coming. Now you say, well, I came here for a, for a, isn't, isn't, isn't preaching supposed to be really happy and positive? No. <laughs> There's some warnings. Wish I had my red flag. Our base player actually gave me one, but I didn't bring it this morning. Red flags. Why is the red flag? Because God wants us to know that didn't the Lord say that in the last days, one of the signs of the end times is this, is that evil will increase what? Greatly. I said, in the last days, end times, end of the church age, evil will increase. Come on, say it again. Will increase? Greatly. Yeah. Now, I don't want it to, but it wasn't up to me. This is the word of God. I'm just telling you, with the, I'm, I'm just the messenger. Pastor Daniel, we're, Danny, we're just messengers. Sorry for calling you Daniel. I'm thinking of the lion's den. You're about to embark on a level of discouragement that's going to attack you, demonic, unprecedented. You need to get this ready. Not this, because this will make this fall in line. I said, this will make this fall in line and stay. I had such a powerful discouragement in my life. Real quick, in less than two or three minutes. My story, I was ostracized by my family, <clears throat> kicked out of the family, raised in, a, raised in a powerful home, nine kids, mom and dad, 11 of us, we had our own tribe. <laughs> and uh, had our own basketball team, softball team, the Boyds, you know. When people didn't want to come to church, they got mad at the pastor. The pastor was happy the way he came to church because it looked full because of the Boyds. <laughs> we supported the pastor 110% and more. But I was ostracized by my mom and dad one year. Long story short, it took me into a level of demonic paranoia, demonic activity. As a matter of fact, I don't have time to share it, but just to let you know that the, the devil came to me through my mom and dad, kicked me out of the ministry, out of the home, out of my life. If you could actually sit, say that I was abandoned and shunned, that's the picture. I was royally shunned for what reason? The reason was, I wanted to leave the family ministry. I wanted to have my own life. I wanted to get married. I wanted to have my own ministry. Come on, are you following? I wanted to have my life. My own children. My own destiny. What God had for me. But my dad didn't want that. Because my dad was so used to having the Boyd family. In those days, you, you guys probably don't know anything about this, but we were, we were the largest country slash southern gospel group traveling in the land. We traveled with the likes of, you guys don't even know these names, but Lowell Lundstrom's. We, we knew the Lundstrom's. We, we used to back up the Lundstrom's. Lundstrom's used to back up. As a matter of fact, my dad, when my dad was younger, 
my dad was the, uh, my dad had a friend, his name was Jimmy Turning Bear, and he was the only steel guitar player in Northeast Montana. And so when the Lundstroms came from, uh, from, uh, from South Dakota into, into Highway 2, they stopped at Poplar to pick up my dad <laughs> and Jimmy Turning Bear, because you couldn't find a steel guitar player anywhere north, south, east, or west for around two, 300 miles. And so that's how we got to know, and they used to play in the bars in the American Legions all across Highway 2, before they all got saved. <laughs> there. But, <laughs> but my, my dad, when he got saved and spirit-filled, my mom, I couldn't understand why they, why they had shunned me. And I realized that because my, my, dad, my dad was blessed to have a family that God was really using. God used the Boyd family in the early 70s, 80s, and 90s as a role model, not just to Native American people anywhere, but to churches who had families. It was rare, in other words, it was rare in those days, in those years I just mentioned, it was rare to see a family, listen, mom and dad, all six sisters, all three brothers, now that's 11, including we had three musicians that traveled with us from Nashville. It was, it was, it was, it was, it was not a typical thing to see us all saved, all spirit filled, all moving in our gifts and talents. It was a sight to behold. And my dad, the same as God used my dad in the highest levels of ministry, we sat and in, 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 we would done worship. Back then, they weren't called worship teams. We were part of the uh, special singing, there you go, <laughs> or special songs, <clears throat> you know, of the general council, home missions department. And I was sitting next to Dr. Paul Young Cho one time, and, and we, were, we were having a great, well, when I left my family, and told my dad I'm leaving. I woke up one morning and he says, you do not belong to this family no more. I'm shunning you. It's like somebody took my heart while I was alive, ripped it right out and threw it in the trash. I went through a demonic paranoia discouragement unlike you can't even ever imagine. I woke up one morning and found, and found myself being plunged into a demonic psychological warfare that sent me into an unprecedented level of discouragement. And just like George Bailey, what's the first thing you want to think of to get out of that? Suicide. It's crazy because I didn't think about suicide. I was so beaten out on, out on the side of, and it was getting, and you know, Montana, when it comes to, when it comes to winter, Starting, you better have your long johns on already before it starts, all righty? I woke up every day sick, cold, clammy, thrown up, not able to eat anything. That's lasted for almost eight months or more. I felt this unprecedented shame that flooded my everyday life. I couldn't go anywhere without some pastor or church hearing that I backslide or I was living with, with my then girlfriend, Mia, my wife. And I was, I was shacking up. I was doing this. I was doing that. So I dealt with being judged from the church, from the people, and everyone that my dad knew, because my dad's word was like gold, and everybody listened to my dad and up to the highest office. And so I was kicked out of my family ministry, the home where I was born, where I was raised. My personal things were taken out. And, and in a suway, I'm, I'm, I'm Lakota, Dakota by race, but I'm child of God by grace. But in a suway, the, 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 the way to shun your family member is to, is, to, is to take their clothes and everything they own out of the house and to go out to the country, dig a hole, put all their belongings in there and light it on fire and then cover it up. But you're supposed to do that when the loved one has passed away, not while they're alive. Now that was my experience. Had it not been for, had it not been for, and people of Israel, this, this scripture I just meant, I, I, I just read to you in Numbers chapter 21, Israel was doing the same thing. They didn't want to listen to God. God already gave them a route. He said, I saved you, I cleaned you, I forgave you. But why are you getting discouraged? You see, there's, if we can't handle discouragement now, what makes us think when greater challenges come, and greater attacks of the enemy that are on its way. What makes you think you're going to stand, see? Without a prayer life. Without knowing the word of God. Without moving in the spirit of God. Some of these phrases, some of you probably don't even know. Or if you do, God bless you. Keep practicing it. 
Exodus chapter 33, verse 15 says it this way. Exodus 33, 15 says, if your presence does not go with me. I like that first part. If your presence does not go with me, do not lead us up from here. I found myself, I found myself in the secret place. There you go. I literally found myself in a closet in Phoenix, Arizona while I was going to Bible college. I was in a closet. I didn't have no furniture, but I got an apartment, had a friend. God put a millionaire in my life. He really did. My wife can tell you that. The guy just, I don't even know the guy. And the, the, guy, and the guy started giving me a room. He said, I don't know why I'm doing this, but I'm supposed to take care of you. Right. You know, it was like, who was, the, who was the prophet that was sitting by the, by, by the tree and the ravens came and brought him to food? I forget his name. But that's what I felt like. God was taking care of me. My heart was broke so bad. My life was so ruined. I really thought that was the end of my destiny for serving God. Because it ends with my dad. He's ruined me. I might as well go backslide. Isn't that the logic thing that we do? We'd rather listen to this than to this, see. We would rather listen to this than to this. Why this? Because the word of God should have been in there, see. All those times of Danny's preaching and Pastor Hall's preaching and teaching and, and all those times of, that you got to see the word up on the screen, <clears throat> all those years of being poured into you should account for some level of spiritual growth in your life now. I found myself in the secret place. I lost so much weight. You can't tell now, but I did. I was wrapped up like a little, how do they say that, an infant? Yeah, how? Fetal position, like that. I was like that for seven months in the closet. Didn't want to come out. But I forced myself out of the closet, got up. I couldn't eat. I drank water, and I went to class. I went to class. And, every, and after class was over, in college, I came back to the room. Went back to the closet, took my clothes off, put my, my Indian clothes on, my, my trunks. My Indian clothes, my trunks, and my sweats. My Indian tennis shoes, put them on, went to the closet. Pull my hood over and just start wailing and crying until I went to sleep. And I found out that in this secret place, there was somebody there. There was always somebody there. And I heard this voice. I'm almost done. I heard this voice say, I'm here. My name is Joy. I'm coming for you this morning. I opened my, took my hood off, opened the door. Who's here? No one was there. Closed the door and it happened again. <laughs> opened the door. I said, okay, who's here? Well, there's no place to hide because I didn't have, I had an empty apartment, just a bed. I mean, my wife can attest to that. A little bit of clothes. Because all my stuff was burned. The J.R. boy that was in ministry was burned up. Nothing left but what I had on my back, my clothes. And I didn't have no money, not a dime. And I told the Lord, is that you? Is that you? Because if your presence does not keep going with me, I might as well die here. I might as well die here. I might as well die here. Because I'm so hungry for your presence. When was the last time you actually cried out with an anguish from God in your prayer life saying, where are you? 
and that vo small voice says, I'm here. My name is Joy, and I'm coming for you this morning. <laughs> At that point in time in my life, after, after being in ministry for almost 25 years, I finally had a real prayer life. Why? Because I found the secret place. I found the secret place. Thank you, sweetie. And I, I heard this voice. And it was like, just like that, this light come into my, into my closet. This is my experience, what I'm about to say. I literally felt this, this shaft of light come in so powerful. And it just like lit me up like a light bulb. And I found myself getting up. And I found myself turning into a, an incredible Hulk. <laughs> the Lord says, you need to stake yourself to the cross from here on in. You need to stake yourself to the cross, son. While you're sitting there, I don't want you to stand, but while you're sitting there, don't bow your head, don't close your eyes, but would you look right at me? Would you say this prayer with me today? Say, Father in heaven, I needed to hear this message today. Say, my spirit bears witness with the experience that J.R. is sharing. I need to raise the bar in seeking the presence of God in my life. I need to stake myself to the cross because greater times are coming. You've given me that warning this morning. I yield to that in Jesus' name. Amen.